I'm Dr. Lori Pierce, the president of the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Thank you for tuning in to this discussion on social determinants of health and their impacts on cancer care. The purpose of this video is to educate and inform. It's not a substitute for medical care and it's not intended for use in the diagnosis or treatment of individual conditions. Guests on this video express their own opinions, experiences, and conclusions. These discussions should not be construed as an ASCO position or endorsement. For this series on the social determinants of health, we invite guests with a wide range of views and perspectives. Some of these conversations may be provocative and some even uncomfortable, but ASCO is committed to advancing equitable cancer care for all individuals, every patient, every day, everywhere. I have dedicated this vision to my term as ASCO president. These conversations bring many voices to the table, voices that we need to hear in order to move forward and find solutions. We hope you learn new ways of thinking about these issues, and we invite you to join us in working toward a world in which every person with cancer, no matter where they live or what they look like, receives high quality, equitable cancer care. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to the sixth episode of the ASCO Social Determinants of Health series. I'm Dr. Randy Vince Jr., a fellow of urologic oncology at the University of Michigan. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Robert Wynn, the director of the Virginia Commonwealth University Massey Cancer Center, and Dr. Sylvie Leotin, who is a technology innovator, cancer survivor, and a recent recipient of a $750,000 Health Equity Innovation Award. This series is part of a new initiative proposed by ASCO president, Dr. Lori Pierce, focused on increasing oncologists' understanding of social determinants of health, its impact on patients, and modifiable risk factors for cancer, excuse me. <clears throat> Inspired by Dr. Pierce's presidential theme of equity, every patient, every day, everywhere. During the fifth episode of this series, hosted by Dr. Smith Graziani, there was a deep dive into the impact of structural racism on medicine, both historically and contemporarily. As a country, we find ourselves at a point of inflection. Many citizens and healthcare providers are starting to grapple with the fact that both interpersonal and structural racism impacts various aspects of our daily lives. As healthcare providers, it is imperative that we understand this history and how this affects our patient-provider interactions. To build on episode five, we will discuss the importance of patient-provider relationships and eliminating cancer disparities. So the first question goes to you, Dr. Wynn. I know you have made community engagement an essential pillar at the Massey Cancer Center mm -hmm. with the goal of reducing and ultimately eliminating cancer disparities. This initiative is a critical step, but many times when we discuss social determinants of health, we talk about factors outside of the health system. But I'm wondering if you can comment on how patient provider communication influences cancer disparities. No, oh, absolutely. And thank you for that. And I think that the work that we're, you know, that's happening at the ASCO right now is, um, is just outstanding. Um, I wanted to actually also go back to making sure that we don't conflate um, individual needs with social determinants of health, because there's sometimes this muddying of individual needs with social determinants. And I wanna make sure that as we talk about it and through the lens of social determinants, that we understand that that's built on structure. And part of that structure is the doctor patient sort of communication, but also the medical community's communication to communities, which is frequently very one directional. And even when we talk about being patient centered, frequently we don't have the patient at the center of our discussions. It becomes almost this very colonial-like, but benevolent colonialism, right? It starts from a good place, but it becomes this very benevolent colonial sort of flavor to it, where we're talking for people, we're talking at people, but we're not talking with folks, nor with communities. Yeah. And so I think that, you know, to keep my answer short, we are going to have to, as a health profession, have a little bit of grace and a little bit, just a touch more of humility to understand that where we have, although well-meaning and certainly we're you know, armed with knowledge, but they are too in communities. And I'll end with sort of saying that 
while we also talk about our patient centered approaches in communities as being sort of illiterate health, you know, health delivery system illiterate or scientifically illiterate, they'll remind you that we are too illiterate. And so trying to talk at people in this unidirectional way will give us some results, but not the best results. And I think there's many more, much more productive results to come if we have a little bit more humility of making sure that we are not just engaging, but involving community. Yes, sir. So the next question I'm gonna pose to you, Dr. Leoton. Um, you know, first I'll say this, you have an impressive background that spans multiple disciplines. Um, and so I have a two part question for you. First, with your expertise as an innovator and your personal experience as a cancer survivor, I wonder if you can share your thoughts about what can be done broadly to improve cross-cultural patient provider interactions. And the second part of the question is you were recently awarded a large grant to collaborate with Emory School of Medicine. Can you share some of your inf some information about your project and the innovative solutions you're developing to help reduce cancer disparities? Thank you for your question, Dr. Vince. First, I would like to stress, um, we're in the heart of the patient first, that um, cross-cultural patient provider communication are worse than many health providers imagine. Mm -hmm. And um, this directly affects disparities. There was a recent study uh, as an example from Genetech that showed that 50% of Black, Latinx, and LGBT patients have delayed or discontinued their care because they didn't feel understood by their providers. So second, to answer your question, I agree uh, with uh, Dr. Wen and I applaud your leadership in, in transforming community engagement. Um, as you said, I think that it's also um, part of the solution. I think that another part of the solution is really improving uh, patient provider relationship inside the hospital. And I see that a lot of providers are not looking at this when um, as a patient, I can tell you that it is really an ess essential component of reducing disparities. And um, I'm going to uh, try to unpack that. So. Um, we talk about trust, we talk about mistrust, and you know, we talk about patients um, needing to trust the healthcare system. But um, we have to realize that trust is a two-sided process and it's not incumbent upon the patient to trust the healthcare system if the healthcare system keeps perpetuating mistrust. So my position is really that um, providers need to step up they need to step up, as Dr. Vince was elo so eloquently saying, they need to step up to inspire trust. And more than inspiring trust, they have to stop fueling and perpetuating mistrust in their day-to-day -day interactions with patients. So I think that the providers are not equipped today to have to build trust and have good relationships with cross-cultural or racially discordant patients. I don't see this thought in medical school and I don't see it in uh, continuing education today. Um, so people will tell me that, you know, now we're starting to see anti-bias trainings and, um, you know, the, why this is a positive thing. I do not think that these training are sufficient to really uh, have an impact on the patient experience of black and brown patients. I think that we need something that is a lot more practical, a lot more pragmatic, experiential, and as Dr. Wynne was saying, patient-centered to really transform cross-cultural patient providers relationships, which leads me to my grant. So I'm happy to share that I recently won a $750,000 health equity innovation grant from Genentech uh, in collaboration with Emory School of Medicine. 
And the grant is going to fund some research with a black patient and oncology providers at the Emory Winship Cancer Center, but also at the Grady um, Hospital in Atlanta. And we are also going to pilot an innovative training, which I design, which is going to help improve cross-cultural patient providers communication. Mm. This training um, is coming from my background as a multicultural cancer patient, but I also have 20 years of experience in, in innovation and in human-centered design. And before I got cancer, I developed a model that is really the underpinning innovation about this training that will really give providers an experiential understanding of what it's like to be a black patient in the healthcare system. Yeah. So I'm not going to take the whole time. <laughs> no, that's amazing. That's amazing. Thank you. And I, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the research that uh, comes out of this and, you know, really providing some useful techniques for providers to implement in their daily uh, interactions with patients. So I'm definitely going to be looking out for that, uh, Dr. Leotin. Um, for my next question, I'm going to pose it first to you, Dr. Wynn, and then Dr. Leotin, you can weigh in on this as well. Uh, so we know that the history of structural and interpersonal racism can influence the, these patient-provider interactions. And so I'm wondering if you can provide thoughts on how specifically providers can establish a trusting relationship with their patients of color, given that this history we just discussed is so ingrained in so many of our daily interactions. Yeah, I think on the practical tip, um, patience matters. And, and I mean that. So, you know, I think this is where sometimes well-meaning physicians get very frustrated that they will say, well, I've been decent to you and I've been pleasant to you and I'm not getting your trust. Martin Luther King once said it best when he sort of says, let's not get decency um, confused with equality. And there is a level where just because you're decent doesn't mean that you're building trust. Decency should be expected yeah. as a health profession. So I'm sometimes confused when people say, well, I've been nice and I'm trying to be nicer. What does that mean? So it, it goes beyond just decency. So trust is built up over time, number one. And I think um, how to say, I think I heard it once best from one of my mentors who says, trust is gained drop by drop by drop. But trust is lost. And when it's lost, it's lost in buckets. And I'll say that there's been reasons why we need to have more patience as health professions to understand that just because you've been good to someone for a year or two years doesn't gain their trust. It may actually gain you some decency back. But that's not the same as trust. So I'm going to sort of say that, you know, people want me to give them a protocol. Because, you know, as academics, everything is protocolized, right? And they want me to give them a protocol for how do I build trust? And I'm going to tell you the following, that your, your mom and your grandmother probably taught you this way long time. You know, be nice, have grace, have humility and patience. Show up and show out every time and do it whether there's, you know, whether you feel that there's being trust built or not, do it anyways. And if you do it anyways, just because it's the right thing, over time, you'll get people in communities trust. So, hmm. Michael, we open your thoughts. Yeah, so really, um, I love this answer. Um, I would like to add my perspective because in the training that uh, I'm developing and I will be piloting at uh, Emory University, we are addressing some of this um, from a different vantage point. You know, I suppose I'm a, I'm a patient, I'm an innovator, I'm not an MD, so I think differently. <laughs> and um, my belief is that um, in addition to what you were describing, Dr. Wynn, there is an element of empathy and cross-cultural empathy that um, is often missing. And this is not about the healthcare industry. This is, 
our society at large. And um, I think that it, this is happening because we have a hard time taking the perspective of someone else without projecting our own projections, filters, bias, assumptions on top of them and thinking, oh, this is what I would do if I were them, instead of really what it's like to be someone else. And um, I love this quote from Apelli that say, you never really understand a person until you consider things from their point of view, until you crawl under their skin and walk around in it. So I developed a training to actually do this in a simulated environment. What I'm seeking to do is to give this really groundbreaking perspective to providers on what it is like, what does it feel like at a visceral level to be a black patient in healthcare undergoing and constantly facing biased interaction. And I think that until we really understand what it's like, it's hard for us to fix it because racism and bias, they operate below the level of our consciousness many times. And um, the, yes, I'll stop here. I'll say more later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'd like to build on that a little bit because okay. I know me and you have you know, spoken prior to, you know, recording this podcast and you you said that in your interaction with many other um, Black oncology patients, there was often a feeling of, of being unheard or feeling dismissed by their providers. And, you know, I know, you know, we'd often talk and Dr. Wynn mentioned this earlier about, you know, illiteracy when it comes to uh, healthcare information or, and often people cite health insurance as a barrier to health equity. But we know that a lot of these disparities exist even in insured educated patients. And so I wonder if you could share some thoughts on why you think this disparity exists. Again, even when patient, Black patients are insured and well-educated like yourself. Yes. I'm, I'm glad that uh, we're making this point today. Um, I personally interviewed um, several, many Black patients with cancer. And I have to tell you that all those people had insurance. Many had great insurance. Many were educated. And they were still experiencing disparities in cancer care. And um, I would like to give you some concrete examples. So there is a woman that I spoke to with stage two cancer. She stopped to take a hormone therapy drug because she didn't know what it was for and the side effects were bothersome. Her oncologist had not even explained what this drug was for. And he had been so disrespectful in their interaction that she never wanted to speak to him again. What happened a few years later is her cancer metastasized. I spoke to another, blue, another black woman who complained of migraines and headaches for two years. Her doctor dismissed her and said that um, it must be stress, your, your, your work is stressful. It became really bad. And one day she had a colleague at work who told her, did you get a blood test? So she went to get a blood test and she found out that she had advanced myelinoma spread to multiple parts in her body. There was a black woman that had also breast cancer who was given a um, choice between a lumpectomy and a, and a mastectomy, but she wasn't able to get the pros and cons from her surgeon who was really rushing her to make a decision without information. She decided to take a mastectomy because she was thinking, oh, I'm gonna be done faster and I won't get to do chemo. Well, after she got a mastectomy, she went to see a medical oncologist and the medical oncologist ordered an Oncotype DX te type test. And it turned out that she had to do chemo. So she was really mad at her surgeon for not um, 
answering her question and rushing her into surgery. She felt that if she had been a white patient, she wouldn't have been treated that way. Fast forward several months, she goes into um, uh, chemo treatment and she had many problems. She told me that they didn't want to give her a port for chemo. They said that she had good veins and she didn't need a port. A port. She kept complaining and nobody listened to her. Those are the stories that are happening. I had my fair share of myself. Yeah. You know, I'm an Ivy League educated black woman. I have four degrees. And um, I had an instance. I had a breast core, bi a core breast biopsy. I was miser miserably butchered by a barbaric radiologist. He took so many, so many, an insane number of samples on me that it was the equivalent of getting a lumpectomy without anesthesia. Hmm. I had horrible post-surgery complications. And many other stories I will share in my book, which I'm finishing and should be published at the end of this year. Yeah. yeah but you. As you can see, um, it's not pretty. Yeah. Thank you for sharing those experiences, um, you know, because this, these stories need to be told more um, because, you know, we can learn from them uh, or, and really these stories constantly need to be promoted so we can make progress. Um, so in closing, Dr. Wynn, I'm going to pose this last question to you. Um, and I just wonder if you can provide your thoughts on how collectively a combination of better patient provider interactions, as well as community outreach can help reduce cancer and other health disparities. Yep, just quickly. I, I think, again, um, all data, great and small, is valued in my world. Mm -hmm. Why community? Because I think that the community, by being honest, by having the humility, by actually doing things differently, will be able to better serve our communities because they will give us some better information to help us literally refine our approaches and maybe even refine our questions. The other thing I would actually add is that, um, that we have an obligation to not just to real serve the community, it also means we should be thinking about how do we actually have them not at the table, but gainfully employed if we want to build trust. So how do we do it? I think by totally like really engaging with the grace and humility that I know we're capable of, I think we will move the next 50 years um, as we have the first 50 years as NCI designated cancer centers, the next 50 years I think we'll do even better because we'll take the community along with us on the ride as opposed to actually doing things to them, we'll start doing things with them. Yeah, absolutely. That was a great Can answer. Can I add something, Dr. Vince? <laughs> One more time, sorry, I didn't Can know. I just add something? Sure, really quick. Yes, I think that in addition to um, talking to the, or in, collab in collaboration with talking to the community, I believe that the training that I'm building is going to equip doctors to be a lot more efficient in their conversation with communities. Cool. So it's yeah. um, both inside and outside yeah. the hospital. Great. Thank you. Um, so this conversation has been incredibly enlightening. I want to thank both Dr. Wynn and Dr. Leotin for being with us today. So as we conclude, I think it's important to say that while conversations like this are vital to impact and change, words alone won't bring about the kind of change that's needed. So it's of the utmost importance that we all back our words with actions and really engage the community and engage with our patients. So I wanna thank everyone for joining us on this episode of the ASCO Social De Determinants of Health series. To keep up with the latest episodes, please click subscribe below. Let us know what you think about the series by leaving a review or emailing us at professionaldevelopment at asco.org. That's all one word. And again, it's professionaldevelopment at asco.org. Also to access any sources mentioned during the show, or to read on Dr. Leoton's recent grant and her company, Equify Health, please check out the show, show resources.